Okay, so today we have two goals. The first one is talking about conventional entropy, third law of thermodynamics, and see how do we use these terms to calculate the, um, the standard conventional entropy of a reaction. Once we have the standard conventional entropy, well, we, last lecture we calculated the reaction, the reaction enthalpy. And this lecture will tell you how to calculate the reaction conventional entropy. And taking it together, we have a way to calculate our uh, standard Gibbs free energy of the reaction. I'll see how far we go. I have a feeling I won't be able to finish 5.8, but we'll see how far we go for 5.7. Okay, let's get started. First of all, what is conventional entropy? So as we were mentioned to, um, a, a while ago, so we were talking about the absolute value of entropy is not defined or whatever we're talking about, we're always talking about entropy changes. Right, so the way to put it, let's do a quick review. If what do we know about the entropy of changes? So if we do a quick review, we know that coming from the second law of thermodynamics, we have dS equals to dQ reversible over temperature. Or the other way to put it is if we take the integration on both ends, we get the integral of dS equals to integral of dQ reversible over T, or we can write delta S equals to integral of dQ reversible over T. Right, so while we're talking about standard state, reversible processes. What do we have? We have our dQ at constant pressure, because standard state is specifying our pressure is always at one bar. So we have um, the dQ reversible does become dQp, and that equals to delta H or Cp dt. Right, Cp, that's the isobaric heat capacity. Or um, alternatively, we can rewrite our delta S for that standard state equals to the integration of dQp over T and dQp equals to Cp dt. That's the integration of Cp over T dt. All right, that, that's a review on what we discussed before in how to calculate the change of entropy. Now, in here, what does it mean? It basically says we can, um, let's come this way. And then later on, remember the goal here is we, we only have relative way to say what is the entropy change. So we need a reference point to say like, hey, what, what's it, what, what is our reference to? What are we referring to when we're talking about conventional entropy? So in conventional entropy, what we're saying is we arbitrarily set the molar entropy for each element in its stable condensed form in the state that pressure equals to one bar, temperature goes to zero K, and our molar entropy is zero. Or if we put it into writing, we have S naught M zero K. That's saying the when temperature is approaching zero K, my S naught M T equals to zero. All right, so in here, what does it mean? So zero, this little knot here means it's standard pressure. The small m subscription denotes for molar entropy. And this zero K here tells you my temperature. Approaches zero. 
right? Or the other way to put it, since we don't have a the absolute entropy as a defined value, we'll just manually say, hey, when the temperature is approaching zero K, the S naught must equals to zero for any element in its condensed form. Let's say carbon is graphite or um, hydrogen or oxygen in its um, condensed solid form when temperature is approaching zero, like a perfect crystal. Yes. What does it mean by in a stable condensed form? Um, we'll get to it, but right now it's just imagine you have an element. It's not forming any complexes. It's just like, say, carbon as in graphite. It's just the element itself in its solid crystalline condensed form. But later on, we'll see this doesn't really matter because even if you have a complex, not only an element, its um, molar entropy also goes to zero when the temperature approaches zero K. So here we just want to say, hey, that's our, that's our beginning point. We're just arbitrarily setting that any element in its condensed form has S, uh, molar entropy equals to zero when temperature approaches zero K. And from here, we'll introduce our third law of thermodynamics, which comes from experimental observation. All right. So third law of thermodynamics, this one is actually more straightforward to understand than our second law of thermodynamics. What it comes from is from an experimental observation. So we have the delta G naught, or the standard gives free energy of reaction. So that's something you can measure experimentally. And that slope versus temperature goes to zero when temperature is approaching zero. Now you don't necessarily have to do that experiment at zero Kelvin, but you can extend that curve to show that delta G naught versus temperature goes to zero. Or the other way to put it, if we write it as mathematical form, we say that when temperature is approaching zero, the partial differential of delta G naught over dt at constant p goes to zero. All right, so this part, this one is experimental observation. And then using this experimental observation alongside with the um, thermodynamic relations we developed before, we can get information about entropy. So here in our Gibbs equation, the one we derived back in chapter 4.4, one of it, is that the partial differential of Gibbs free energy over T at constant P equals to negative S. And also note in here, in our last lecture, or two lectures before, we mentioned that um, the change of Gibbs free energy over temperature is not defined. And that is because the absolute value of entropy is not a defined term in thermodynamics. So we'll never ask you about how does Gibbs free energy change with respect to temperature or temperature dependence of Gibbs free energy because it's an undefined term. And in your textbook, you'll see true and false problem and say like delta G is not defined if temperature is changing. All right, so with this in hand, what does it mean? Now thinking about what do we have here, in here we have this partial differential of delta G naught, right? So what, what, what are we doing here is first write my delta S naught equals to S2 minus S1. And then using this Gibbs equation, we can rewrite my S2 and S1 using the Gibbs relation or the partial differential equation of Gibbs free energy. And that equals to negative of dg2 over dt at constant p plus partial differential of g1 at over T at constant P. And that's effectively just the one we just um, write. That's a partial differential of delta G naught equals to over DT at constant P. 
All right, and again, we can do that is because both of them are over T and both of them are at constant P. Or the other way to put it is you have dx plus y equals to dx plus dy in this case. Or taken together, what we end up having is this term inside that experimental observation, which is the partial differential of delta G naught over T at constant P equals to zero. It's the same to say that we have when temperature is approaching zero, the delta S naught equals to zero. That's coming from our experimental observation, again, that my delta G naught of a reaction versus time, and that slope approaches zero when temperature approaches zero. All right. So what do we have here? So in this case, we started by saying, hey, this, here is the experimental observation. The slope of delta G naught versus temperature approaches zero when temperature approaches zero. And then we used our thermodynamic relations to say that partial differential of G over T at constant P equals to S. Right? So in this case, what this experimental observation gives us is the um, delta S naught of the, any reaction when temperature is approaching zero equals to zero. And now we're ready to introduce our third law of thermodynamics. This is called nurse simon statement of the third law of thermodynamics. Again, this just tells you we have different ways to say the same law of thermodynamics. So here it just says, for any isothermal process that involves only substance in internal equilibrium, the entropy change goes to zero as temperature goes to zero. It, it's just a more complete way of saying what we just showed before. It's coming from an experimental observation. And now let's look at how do we use the third law of thermodynamics and what exactly does it mean when we're trying to use the third law of thermodynamics together with the conventional entropy. So here, imagine we have a reaction, which is the, um, in, in, in this case, we have H2 plus one half of O2 go to H2O. Note that in both cases, we're writing them as solid, because remember, we're talking about the temperature is approaching zero Kelvin. So everything is a solid condensed phase in this case. So what do we have here? So in this case, the goal here is now we know that my delta S naught or the standard molar entropy um, for condensed elemental form is zero. What about a substance that's not a condensed elementary form? Using the second law, using the third law of thermodynamics, can we find the conventional entropy of any substances, not only the elemental form? All right, so what do we have here? So first of all, using the um, third law of thermodynamics, what do we have? We have the de delta S naught equals to, well, product minus reactant, that's the reaction entropy, that's the SM naught of my H2O solid minus SM naught of my reactant H2 minus one half SM naught of my reactant O2. Right, so that's reaction entropy, pro uh, product minus reactant. And then in here, remember we arbitrarily set that all my elements in their stable condensed form. So whenever you see an element, um, that's H2, O2, carbon, um, N2 in its solid like condensed form, we know they equal to zero. Or the other way to put it is we have limit T go to zero, the S naught M zero of H2. Actually I can put MT 
equals to zero and limit t goes to zero s not mt o2 goes to zero all right so any elementary uh, form of my starting material hydrogen and oxygen they are both zero the molar entropy the conventional molar entropy are always zero then using the, our third law of thermodynamics, we know that this um, reaction, the conventional reaction of entropy for any isothermal processes when temperature is approaching zero goes to zero. Right, so what do we have? So using the third law, we have my delta S naught equals to zero. Let me use a different color here. for any process that when temperature is approaching zero. And also using our arbitrary set that my elements in stable condensed form equals to zero, we have these two terms goes to zero. All right, so taking together in this part, it's just a quick demonstration that for any elements or compounds, when temperature is approaching zero, its conventional entropy is always zero. When temperature is approaching zero Kelvin. All right, so again, back, back to what we have. We first write out the formation of my substance, whatever substance it is. Now it must be in solid form since we're talking about temperature approaching zero. Now from here, we know that according to the third law of thermodynamics, the delta S naught of the reaction when temperature approaches zero must equal to zero. Also, we arbitrarily set that the conventional entropy of any elements in its stable condensed form equals to zero. So these are my um, elements in their stable condensed form. And as a result, we get to the point to say that my standard conventional molar entropy of H2O, which is not an element, but it must also equals to zero when temperature is approaching zero. Or what we are doing here is generalize our previous um, hypothesis or our previous set. So now the general form is saying the conventional entropy of any elements or compounds in internal equilibrium is zero when temperature approaches zero or S naught equals to zero. So in this class, we'll only talk about um, materials that are in internal equilibrium. There's no like changes of its crystal structure taking place. But for this class, uh, we're, I'm not going to test you on whether or not a substance is at internal equilibrium. All right, so basically what we're doing here is using the third law of uh, thermodynamics and general, generalize our conclusion to say that any element or compound, um, their conventional entropy equals to zero when temperature is approaching zero or S naught equals to zero. And now this one is our conventional entropy. Okay, any questions? Okay, so far so good. And now let's think about an example. So we'll work on a, um, so first of all, I'll go over the general procedure in how to calculate conventional entropy for a substance. And then we'll look at an example together to see experimentally how the scientists define their uh, measured conventional, standard conventional entropy in the appendix data. All right, so two goals. First of all, think about it. Do we know what is the conventional entropy? What is our reference point? So we know when temperature approaches zero, my standard conventional entropy equals to zero. And then, we know how to calculate the entropy change at constant pressure or isobaric entropy change at constant pressure. Right? So taking together, we have everything we need in order to calculate the standard conventional entropy at any given temperature. Right? So for example, if we use water as an example, 
let's say we want to have water, the, the standard conventional entropy of liquid water at certain temperature Tf, which is higher than its melting point at 180 m. How are we going to set up this calculation? So this one, I'm going to use water as an example to walk you through in steps we are taking. And then we'll take one um, example question together to see how we solve a real problem. All right, so in here, we have several different steps, right? So thinking about what is our each step here. First step, we started from solid H2O at 0K. We know our initial point is a standard conventional entropy or S0, um, SM 0K standard equals to zero, right? So that's our starting point. And the first step is the temperature increase of my solid H2O into its melting point. That's our first step. So what does that mean? So the first step is basically a isobaric um, warm or temperature increase. from 0K to T melting. All right, and remember in our review, what is the delta S expression for this process? So that goes back to our review here, right? Remember we did our review same for isobaric processes, my delta S, the change of my conventional entropy, my change of my entropy equals the integral of Cp over T dt. And that's for isobaric reversible processes. All right. And that means we can write our delta S A equals the integral of 0 to T melting divided by CPM naught of H2O solid over temperature dt. All right. So in here, we have one thing to keep in mind. That in here, we have something. We're taking the integration between 0k to the melting temperature. So one thing to keep in mind is that 0K is not possible. So we can never get to absolute zero or 0K. And also my CPM, so my isobaric molar heat capacity is not measurable. When, it's, when temperature is smaller than 15 Kelvin. So typically, when we're looking at the temperature differences between zero to 15 Kelvin, or sometimes in your textbook, it's referring to low temperature, what we'll do is approximate this integral between zero to 15 Kelvin um, to be equal to my CPM T low. So this T low is referring to the uh, isobaric heat, molar heat capacity at very low temperature. And this very low temperature is typically 15 Kelvin in our textbook over T dt. And my CPM T low or sometimes we can also write it as CPM 15 Kelvin. This equals to A T third, where A is a constant. And this equation comes from statistical mechanics. Um, we are not gonna go over it. So right now, just accept that from mathematical interpretation, we have a way to calculate or to estimate what is the CPM um, temp at very low temperature. So plugging this number, a, that 
we have 0 to 15 Kelvin and 83rd divided by t dt, you solve that integral, we end up getting 83rd over 3. Right, so my temperature and the t-third cancel out to be t-square. You solve the integral of t-square, you end up getting 83rd to 3, over 3. Or since my 83rd equals to um, CPM 15K, we can also write this one as CPM T low divided by 3. All right, so this is to deal with the very low temperature region for my first integration. Let's call this one A1. And then I have my A2 integration. My A2 integration is now we have 15K to T melting. And that's just the normal integration of your CPM of the species over T dt. Right now we can measure um, the isobaric molar heat capacity as a function of temperature. So my AT2 is just a normal solve for that integration. All right. And what about the second step? So back to here. We have H2O solid at melting point. Go to H2O liquid at melting point. So the nature of my step B is the isobaric phase change. Right, so for an isobaric phase change, we have delta S B equals to the delta H melting divided by T melting. Right, so delta H melting, that's at constant pressure, my um, dQp equals to delta H. The integration of dQp um, equals to delta H. And the last step, which is process C, so this one, it's the same idea, right? So we have isobaric increase of temperature so my delta S C thus equals to this integration between T melting to T final. And we have this C P naught of H2O liquid divided by T dT. And adding everything together, we have our conventional entropy of water, liquid water at its final temperature at 1 ATM. Okay, any questions? Nope. Okay, let's do one example together. And it's a very comprehensive example. So, so far we have so many different integrations and equations to set up the problem. But what does a real problem look like, right? So how does scientists actually come up with a number for the standard conventional entropy in our appendix data? So we will use our uh, textbook example, which is here, talking about SO2 as an example. This one is a long question, but we'll do it stepwise to see how do we set up the problem. First of all, we read the problem and get the information we want. Now for SO2, it's giving us the normal melting and boiling point are 197.6 Kelvin and 263.1 Kelvin. And normal melting point and boiling point are telling us that's a melting point and boiling point at 1 ATM. And I'll give you that information if needed. We haven't ca talked about phase rule yet. And it's also giving us a heat of fusion and vaporization to be 1769 and 5960. So these are the delta H 
or the enthalpy of fusion and vaporization. It also tells us at normal melting, um, yeah, and these are the number at normal melting and boiling point. Also gives us a plot, which is the CPM at 1 ATM graphed versus loin T in this figure from 15 Kelvin to 298 Kelvin. And the CPM number is given to be 0.83 cal calorie per mole Kelvin. It also gives us the change of entropy when we take in consideration of ideal versus real. So remember, here we're talking about SO2 gas. We're looking for the standard conventional entropy for SO2. Well, it's standard status ideal gas, but when we're doing the measurement, that's real gas. And it asks you to estimate the standard molar entropy of SO2 at 298 Kelvin. So this is one of those problems that's super, super comprehensive. It used all kinds of information together. So first of all, what do we have? So in this diagram, one of the things, or the first thing to keep in mind, is we're plotting CPM versus loin T. Why do we do that? So before we started doing that, just think about this way. What do we have here is my, what we want is to find a way to calculate this integral, CPM as a function of T over T dt. And we eventually want a way to solve for that integral. So there are two different ways we can do that. One would give you a mathematical expression of CPM T, or we can do it as what this graph is given. Right, so taking the integration is basically asking you what is the area below the curve. So in this case, what is the area below the curve? In this one, we have my CPM as a function of T times ln T, or versus ln T. Or in here, we have the D ln T over DT equals to 1 over t, or if we move the dt to the right-hand side, we have d ln t equals to 1 over t dt. Yes? Yeah, sure. All right. So what does this mean? This means my d ln t equals my 1 over t dt. So in this original equation, this is what we're trying to solve here. We can write that to be equal to CPMT D ln T. Or in this diagram, by looking at the area below the curve, we have a way to estimate what this integration is. All right. So this one is building a link, link, or to give us a way to solve for the area below curve. Okay. And now let's look at this problem itself. What it is asking? It's asking for us, what is C? Um, conventional, the, what is the standard conventional entropy at our final point, which is here, right? So the question is asking the standard molar entropy of my SO2 gas. So what are, what are we looking for? So here, what do we know about our standard state? We know that P naught equals to one bar. We also know gas is ideal. And we have temperature equals to 298 Kelvin. But at the starting point at zero K, that's where we start from. But we know that S M zero K 
of SO2 solid equals to zero. So we're trying to calculate how does my entropy change every step along the way. So we're translating my SO2 solid at zero K all the way to my standard condition for my SO2 gas. All right. And a few toolboxes do we have? What are the toolboxes we have? So this one gives us a way to calculate how does the isobaric, um, isobaric temperature increase. So whenever we have an isobaric temperature increase, we can estimate it using the area below the curve. And whenever we have a isobaric phase change, what do we have? We have the delta S of that phase change equals to delta H of the phase change over temperature of that phase change. And we have two more things we need to take, on, uh, take care of. Again, in my original case, we have solid SO2. In our measurement, we have real gas, right? So we want to take care of the difference between entropy of my ideal gas and entropy of my real gas. And that in this question is a given number. And that's given to be S ideal minus SN real equals to a number, which is 0.07. And in addition, at the very last, we have to take consideration of the pressure change. Because everything given here in the question are my normal melting point and normal boiling point at 1 atm. So after we did all, all of our calculation, we need to translate that eight, 1 atm into 1 bar. So we have standard um, condition. So that's going to be our final state, which is the isothermal pressure change of ideal gas. So this is again something we covered before, the delta S, the isothermal pressure change of ideal gas equals to R over V dV. You can write that as R log V final over V initial or R log P initial over P final. So this part is something we did before when we talk about change of ideal gases. So these are the armulets we have to solve this problem. So what I'm going to do is um, basically write them like one step at a time and then think about do we have a way to solve for this problem. So first of all, let me move this one to the bottom. Okay. So, thinking about what do we start from? We start from our state one. Right, so in our state one, we have temperature approaches zero K. So that's our starting point. We have our solid SO2 and my molar entropy of my solid SO2 equals to zero. That's our starting point. First step, increase the temperature to 15 Kelvin. That's using our low temperature process. So my T2 equals to 15 Kelvin. And the equation we're using is the one 
we just derived here. When we talk about the temperature as low, and we estimate what that changes. So my delta S is roughly the CPM 15K and divided by three. All right, so that's what we have here. That's a low temperature. And do we know what our low um, temperature CP is? And yes, well, in the question, we're reading at 15 Kelvin, my CPM is 0.83 calorie per mole per Kelvin. So we have a way to solve for this one. Now my entropy is delta S 1 to 2. This one is 1 to 2. All right. Now what do we have? We have my solid SO2 at 15 Kelvin. The next one, we want to raise the temperature all the way to melting point. What is my melting point? My normal melting point is 197.6. 197.6 Kelvin. And how do we calculate that? So in this case, what we're writing here is delta S 2 to 3 is equal to the integral of my 15 Kelvin to 197.6 Kelvin, and that's the CP n naught divided by T dt. And we went over this to say like that's just the area below the curve for my solid SO2. All right, so on the curve, what do we have? This one is roughly a triangle. So effectively, what we are saying here is we're trying to say, hey, what's the area below this triangle? Right, so we're just estimating the area below this triangle here. So what does it mean? So in this case, that's around the area below the triangle. So to estimate that triangle, you have one half, the bottom times the, the height. So the bottom one, remember that's ln t. So that's my ln t final over t initial times the height. So the height is the difference between your CPM. So that's your CPM at 197.6 Kelvin minus your CPM at 15 Kelvin. All right, and then plugging the numbers, what we have? One half line T final, 197.6 divided by T initial, 15, times the CPM, that's about 16, and minus my, uh, well, the CP low, which is 0.83. Or if you don't minus it, just take it as like zero. That's also fine. I don't take points away. It's an estimate anyway. All right, so that's how you set up my calculation. And the key here is that we're estimating this integral using the area below the curve, which in this case, that's just roughly a triangle. And we're using the area below the triangle to estimate what this integral is. All right, so that's between my straight to four. So where are we at this diagram here? So now we are at this point. Right, so we eventually raised up the temperature, so we are at the um, melting point. So obviously, the next step is my T4 at 197.6 Kelvin, and we're melting. And we want it to be a liquid. So my delta S from straight to 4 is the delta S of melting, 
which is the delta H of melting over P melting. All right, so every step along the way, we started from, this is our step one, this is our two, and this is our three, and here is our four. We're at our liquid phase, right? What about our point five? Point five is the same idea. Now we are at the melting point, but eventually we want it to be at our vaporization point and then raise it up to our final temperature, right? So obviously we want to raise up our temperature into my vaporization temperature. So my T5 will be raised up to my vaporization temperature, which is 263.1. And it's still liquid. So this is the same idea. It's a, it's a liquid, yes, but we're still using this integral here between 197.62 to 261.1. And we're taking the integration of my CPM over T, dt, and that's estimated with area under the curve. Right, so what, what is that area? So four is at this point, and five is here, right? So the area below the curve, we're looking at this little area here, right? So that's a trapezoid, and you can estimate what my um, heat capacity is for that top and bottom height, and we know what temperature here, right? So this one is our melting point. This one is my T vaporization. Right, so we have all the numbers we need, like in this case, we're just calculating that to be, well, one half times the line temperature difference, T final over T initial, which is 263.1 over 197.6 times about 21 plus 19. So these are the heat capacities we identified. A little bit above and below 20. It's an estimate, so, right? so if you give me 20.5 and 19.5, that's fine. Just the idea. So that's at five now. And what about six? Now six, we're going back, right? We have another phase change. Now we have the vaporization from my liquid to gas, right? So this process, six is my vaporization between five to, to my gas phase. So my six will be So at state six, we have T6 at 263.1 Kelvin, real gas, phase change. And that equals to delta H of vaporization over T vaporization. So that's at our state six. And I'm running out of time, but we have two more steps to take consideration, right? So right now, what do we have? Right now, we have a real gas, and we have one ATM, and we want it to be at our final temperature, 298 Kelvin. So a few things we need to do, right? First is likewise, take the area below the curve to get the temperature into 298 Kelvin, and then address the difference between my real gas and ideal gas using the number given, and then ch translate the pressure change of an ideal gas. So I'll see a full walkthrough in my annotated note. So this represents a very long and comprehensive um, problem. 
like say how did we actually end up with the number in our appendix table in our textbook. And we'll, we'll end here. Um, this is all we're going to cover for our midterm two, which ends at conventional entropy, meaning like where it comes from, how it's defined, and how the scientists come up with the tabulated data for our conventional entropy. All right, I'll see you on Wednesday.